Hi, it's Kathleen, and today's video will be about making my pair of combinations as part of my ongoing project to create a full set of late Victorian undergarments. I will be using late Victorian primary resources for most of my research, but I'm also referencing a few different blogs and blog posts of other people chronicling their similar projects for those like I have no idea what this book is saying, I really just need to see a picture for those moments. Um, but I'll get in more into what resources I'm using specifically as I work. Anyway, I will be using late Victorian, mostly 1880s, drafting and construction techniques to the best of my ability, but when it comes to decoration, I'm planning to lean a little more Edwardian just because I like all the lace and the ruffles and the fancy bits that the Edwardians used. This is partially an aesthetic decision to kind of diverge from purely historical, but I also had a lot of trouble finding pictures of extant garments from the 1880s and 90s to reference for decoration. The vast majority of pictures I could find were dated from 1900 to 1910. Still, even in this relatively small sample size of garments, I noticed that there was a wide variety of amounts and styles of decoration. Some were extremely plain, others were very elaborate. And I'm planning to go somewhere in the middle there. Rambling aside, let's get started making some combinations. I am drafting this pattern using the Practical Designer for Women's and Misses Underwear by Isidore Rosenfeld, a pattern making manual published in 1881. It is free from archive.org or the Library of Congress. I started by making a one-fourth scale pattern to practice the Rosenfeld system of drafting. It was not easy at first, it took me a couple tries to get used to the way the instructions are worded, but with some practice, some trial and error, it eventually felt less like calculus and more like doing a dot to dot. A fair warning, there are a few typos, like saying a half instead of a fourth, that will completely throw off your draft if you are following the written instructions alone. This is another reason I'd recommend practicing the, the method a few times before you make your actual pattern pieces, and always, always, always checking with the diagrams to make sure everything's going according to plan. Rosenfeld doesn't have a lesson on drafting split drawers combinations, so I am Frankensteining two patterns together, the waist up of a simple chemise pattern, and a pattern for split drawers. Once I was confident with my one fourth scale version, I started drafting the pattern. I also drafted the pattern for my corset cover at the same time, but that is a different project. The next step is cutting out the pieces. All of the patterns in Rosenfeld's book include seam allowances in the instructions, so I could cut just right along the edge of the pattern, didn't need to worry about any of that. For my fabric, I'm using a white sheet from Goodwill. It is 65% cotton and 35% polyester. I would have preferred a 100% cotton fabric, but for this project, my budget went mostly into the lace, so I was willing to make some compromises on the fabric. I started with the bodice, specifically the center back seam, which was sewn with a back stitch and finished by turning and felling. I really could have cut this on the fold, but the chemise pattern specifically called for a center back seam, and this wasn't difficult, so I just went ahead and did it. Then I made a narrow hem on each of the pieces where the side seams would normally be. Just to be fancy, I decided to make the side seams out of insertion lace, so I wanted these edges finished ahead of time so attaching the lace would be easier. To make the lace more visible and to make more work for myself in the process, I made each of the seams a double width by sewing two strips of insertion lace together with a very small, careful back stitch. At first I used a running stitch, but it wasn't strong enough and so I needed to go back and redo it. I found that a back stitch worked much better. I then connected the front and back bodice pieces by whip stitching the lace to the hems I had made earlier. I ended up not being a huge fan of how it looked. The stitches were just a lot more visible than I expected to be and it didn't look as neat as I was picturing in my head. So for the rest of the insertion lace, I used a back stitch instead, which I can't guarantee would work for every type of lace, but this particular lace that I have 
because of how it looks that blended in very nicely and disappeared relatively well. Next, I ran two rows of gathering threads along the waist. Fun fact, this is actually the exact same gathering threads I used for the cuffs of my 18th century shirt. If I have long gathering or basting threads, I, I like to save and reuse them if I can. It's just a way to get more use out of less thread. After that, I prepped the front of the bodice where the closure will be. In the original chemise pattern, the front was to be cut on the fold without a closure, so instead I followed the closure instructions from the corset cover draft, which instructed to include an extra inch at the center front to be turned in as a facing for the button and buttonholes. So that's what I did. I pressed it twice, turned the facing and the raw edge under, then I secured it with felling stitches. Even though I drafted the bodice according to the chemise pattern, straps included, I'd originally planned to leave the straps on just long enough to make fitting easier, but then eventually cut them off and replace them with ribbons or lace. But I ended up really liking how the pattern looked as is, so I went ahead and hemmed the neckline and armholes and then made a very short French seam for the shoulders and the bodice was put together. It was at this point that I realized I didn't have much of a plan. The bodice was pretty intuitive, it's basically a fancy tank top, but when it came to the drawers I realized I didn't know what I was doing. I wasn't using a pattern that came with instructions, and unlike a few of my other historical projects, I hadn't been lucky enough to stumble upon one thing with step-by-step -step construction guide for the entire garment. So I took a break from sewing, and I sat down and I wrote out a step-by-step -step plan for the rest of the project. It wasn't set in stone, like you must do everything in exactly this order, and I did end up changing a few things around, but it was really nice to know I had a list of every single step I needed to do, and I didn't need to worry that I'd skipped something and would need to undo a bunch of stuff to fix it, and also it just gave me an order to work in, like if I didn't know what should I, where should I go next, no problem, I could just look right at my list. I would highly recommend doing this for any project that you're not working from pre-written instructions. Even if you're like, yeah, I know how to do it. Having that physical list is so useful. I'm back in the craft room and I've just finished having both sides of all four parts of the drawers half of the combinations. This inner edge is hemmed because it will become the opening of the split drawers. And then this outer edge normally wouldn't be hemmed, it would just be a normal side seam. But because I'm using that width of lace to connect the side seams, I do need this to be hemmed so it can be attached to the lace without worrying about fraying. So when I was making the front of the drawers, I made a little bit of an error. Essentially, I wasn't paying attention when I was pinning and turning the fabric and pinning it. So I ended up with what is pretty much two left legs instead of a left and a right. Um, the fabric was still cut out correctly, so it is the right side of the fabric facing out on both sides still, but on what will become the right leg, the hem is turned towards the outside instead of the inside. I don't know. Yeah, you can see. So that is supposed to be on the inside, but on one of the legs, that would be on the outside, and then this side will be on the inside. Um, I could go back and tear it all out and turn it around and fix it, but it is a small enough detail on a part of the garment that is already not very visible. On a garment that is an undergarment, I, at this point, I'm just going to move on and not worry about it. So, yes, little imperfections, but there always are. I then made the side seams by again attaching a double width of insertion lace to each of the hemmed edges, this time, like I said before, with a back stitch. I struggled a bit to decide how to connect the two legs of the drawers into something that could be attached to a waistband. I had a lot more success finding references for the construction of drawers as a individual garment than as drawers 
in combinations and so most of what I had about how to make drawers wasn't something that translated well to combinations so I just I was a little bit stuck and I went back to a so historically blog post that had been a big inspiration for this project. I really love that Lena, who writes these blog posts, includes tons and tons of links to all her references and her images and all the primary sources she uses. Um, going through her article, I could look through those resources and I was able to find these pictures of a pair of combinations closed at the back with an inverted box pleat. And I was like, hey, that's something I can do. And so they had enough close up pictures that I could figure out how it was done. And so I decided to go with that method. Because I hadn't originally thought this far ahead and had already hemmed both edges, I whip stitched the center back seam together for an arbitrary seven and a quarter inches. I then made a one inch wide inverted box pleat and connected the folded edges with a slip stitch, leaving pins at the waistline for now just to hold everything in place. For the front closure, I added a placket. I wanted the drawers and bodice edges to line up once it's all connected and to have the same amount of overlap for the drawers as for the bodice, but I was worried this would take too much fabric out of the waistline of the drawers and I wouldn't get as much of a nice gathered look as I wanted. My entire process for this section is totally my own guesswork based on images I've seen and I do not know whether or not it accurately reflects any techniques used at the time. I started by pressing the seam allowances under on both pieces and then folding them in half and pressing again. On each side I stitched the front and back of the placket down separately. I probably could have gotten away with stitching through both layers at the same time, but this ended up with a very smooth finished look that I'm happy with. I've been sewing during some of my classes this past week, so I just wanted to check in and talk about what I've gotten done since I was able to film last. So starting with the drawers, I finished the placket on both sides. Um, and then I ran the gathering threads up um, there, I think you can see it. So I decided for the drawers to run the gathering threads in four different sections. So these are actually separate pieces, um, stopping at the pleat in the back. So that was relatively simple. I also sewed the inseam, which is very different from an inseam in normal pants because it is only this long, where normally it would be this entire thing. Um, I, for that, I just backstitched and then finished the seam allowances by turning and felling. It's a really short seam, so it was pretty simple. Something I did notice, and this is getting into the not mistakes realm, but kind of things not going quite as planned realm. Uh, when Once the drawers were constructed, like they are here, I could kind of try them on and look at the fit some. And I noticed the, the open part of the split drawers goes a lot further down on my thigh than I wanted it to. And this goes back to the drafting process. Uh, with the rise measurement, which as described in the book I was using, is the measurement from your natural waist to the surface seat of a chair when you're sitting down. And so that measurement, and they had a certain number of inches to add to it to make sure your drawers had plenty were very roomy, roomy, had lots of extra fabric. Um, and I, I even added less than they said to, and still the rise, the rise ends up being how much of the of the drawers is open. Yeah, it's just a lot more than I was expecting it to be. This isn't necessarily a mistake. It's just kind of different than what I intended. And I've been trying to decide if I want to do anything about this or not because it is an undergarment. So there's that. Um, it's not super important that everything is exactly exactly right but I do I don't know it's just it's a lot 
one thing I was considering was essentially, because there's nothing I can do to make this seem longer, which is ideally what would fix this. So it's kind of too late on that, but what I could do is essentially make, if, if this is, there's the seam, make this length shorter by instead of attaching the waistband up here, attaching it at some point down in here. When I was first considering that, I was worried, oh, well then, since the placket's already attached, that's instead of having this much placket, there's only this much. But I went back to my research, some of my reference images, and looking at those, from what I could tell, it looked like most the where the buttons went below the waistband. There was really only one or two buttons. It didn't necessarily, it, I didn't need a very long placket. So I'm planning to go ahead and raise that by a couple inches. I will fix the, fix the length issue because that would make them a little scandalously short for the 1880s. But I'm planning to fix that by putting a wide ruffle uh, and then I have some relatively wide um, lace for the trim also to make those then the correct length. That does mean I'm going to have to redo the gathering threads, but since I already have these cut the right length, I can just move them down two or three inches and it'll be all good. So I'm going to get back to fixing that and I will see you guys later. Oh, one thing. I also did make the waistband. It's a rectangle of fabric that is a couple inches longer than my natural waist um, to have extra room so it's very comfortable to move. This is a note. I did measure my waist sitting down because I have found sometimes skirts that I've made when I took my measurement, waist measurement standing up and made that waistband very fitted. But then when I sit down, it feels like a little tight, whereas it's plenty comfortable standing up but then sitting down. Yeah, it's kind of like, uh. So I did, I added an extra inch just to be sure because since this is the undermost layer, I am fine with it not being super fitted. I want it just to be very comfortable. So I did that and then I turned and held the edges under to have that nice finished edge that I'll be able to put buttons and button holes on. Next, it was time to gather the drawers to the waistband. On the waistband, I marked key points, namely the center back and the quarter points where the side seams would end up lining up, keeping in mind the amount of overlap there would be at the center front. I then pinned these points to the corresponding points on the drawers to use as a guide for my gathering. There actually wasn't much gathering to do, which I don't know if anyone else feels this way, but to me, is almost more difficult than gathering a ton of fabric into a small measurement. With a lot of gathering, I feel like it's more forgiving since each individual gather is less visible. But with this, I just did my best to stroke the gathers and get everything even, but was not entirely successful in this endeavor. However, it is passable and I'm giving myself quite a bit of leniency on this project. It is an undergarment and I set out to make something fun not something perfect. After gathering, I attached the drawers and the waistband with a French seam. I then measured one and a quarter inches up from that seam and repeated this process with the bodice. I wanted a roughly three quarters to one inch wide waistband, so I marked the second seam at one and a quarter inches because I knew that some of this width would get lost in the French seam. It is then time for more stitching.
With construction all finished, it is time to move on to the fun part. Decorations. Ribbons, lace, ruffles, the whole nine yards. So for the neckline and the waistband, I used the same method. Every five eighths of an inch, I cut a vertical slit in the insertion lace about three eighths of an inch long in order to thread my ribbon through. I should be using eyelet lace for this step, which would already have spots to lace the ribbon through, but only buying one type of lace was the more cost efficient method for me. Anyway, I attached the lace with a running stitch, throwing in a back stitch every few inches for some added strength. Here on the waistband, I stitched both the top and bottom edge to the garment, but on the neckline, I only attached the bottom edge. Also on the neckline, I left several inches of ribbon at the center front to make a bow, while on the waistband, I simply turned the end of the ribbon to the inside of the garment and stitched it in place. When it came to decorating the drawers, I knew I wanted to have a ring of insertion lace between the drawers proper and the ruffle, but the drawers were already a bit scandalously short from the fiddling I'd done to fix the rise, so I really wanted to take as little length out as possible in the hemming process. What I came up with was turning the edge once towards the right side of the fabric instead of twice towards the wrong side, and then using a ribbon I was already gonna sew on for decoration to cover that raw edge, and so I stitched that on with a running stitch, and it was a great two birds with one stone solution. With the edge finished, I sewed the insertion lace on with a back stitch. A running stitch would have been easier and probably would have been fine, but since unlike the collar and the waist, this lace is load bearing for lack of a better word, I wanted to make sure it was plenty secure. I'm trying to cut fabric. I have a little friend has joined me and is sitting on my fabric. <laughs> so helpful. For each leg, I cut a two yard long, four inch wide ruffle. I hemmed the edge of each and then attached the trim lace with a running stitch. There's a bit of a story with this lace. It took me three separate trips to Joann's to get the amount I needed of the right kind and the right width between not buying enough originally, getting home and realizing I had the wrong width, the bolt of the right kind of lace running out, and etc etc. I eventually ended up with the four yards of three and a half inch wide lace that I needed but it was in three separate pieces one of which was their ruffled lace so it came like slightly gathered because they'd run out of their non-ruffled lace and it ended up looking fine I would say the word and tone would be fine. I would have preferred to have all the lace be one way or the other I'm fine with it as is. If at some point in the future I want to replace the lace with something that is more uniform and not as pieced together, that's something I could easily do. But for now, we just gotta remember, piecing is period, so not something to worry about necessarily. With each ruffle prepped, it was time to learn a new skill, attaching gathered fabric to a piece of lace. Luckily, I decided to do the smart thing and pause to do some more research instead of just jumping in and trying my best. And wouldn't you know it, another So Historically article was what saved me. I'll leave a link to the article in the description if this is something you want to learn how to do. It involves using overcasting to hem and run gathering threads at the same time, but I'm not yet familiar enough with the technique to feel comfortable trying to explain in detail how it's done, but here I am demonstrating on a scrap in contrasting thread. It was tricky at first and I went through several very confused practice versions, but I got the hang of it after a bit. I did find it is much easier if you pin one end to something like a cushion or a tailor's hand, or what I found best was the arm of an upholstered chair. That can give you some tension while you work, which trying to work with it just flat on my desk was a nightmare. With the tension though, it was a lot easier. 
Then, to finish up the decorations, I added a bow to the side seams of the drawers just for a little extra bit of flair. With that done, I added buttons and buttonholes down the center front. I'm still not in possession of buttonhole twist, so instead I used three strands of embroidery floss for the buttonholes. Also, the buttons I bought in my original materials run ended up looking a lot bigger and chunkier on the finished garment than I thought they would. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it was a good learning experience that in the future, if I want the look of very small, delicate buttons, I should remember to buy smaller buttons than I think I need. Either way, with the closure finished, it's official. I have a pair of combinations. This was a really fun project. I think largely because the base design was not something particularly complicated, so I was able to make the decorative parts much more elaborate without the overall project becoming too complex or overwhelming. I love how these turned out. My favorite part is the bow on the side seam of the drawers where just all of that lace comes together in one spot and it's just so over the top. Is all of this frilliness completely unnecessary to the functioning of the garment? Oh, for sure. But what can I say? It's just fun. I hope you enjoyed this video, learned something, or maybe even got inspired to make something of your own with altogether too much lace. Whatever the case may be, have a lovely day and happy sewing.